Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone feels a bit more awake um, having a coffee after the break. Um, <clears throat> today, I want to talk to you uh, about um, OpenShift Hive. Maybe not everyone from you will know Hive, um, um, but uh, we use Hive um, at WorldPay. A little bit about ourselves. Um, my name is Bernd. I'm the principal container platform engineer at WorldPay. Um, I moved from Berlin to London in 2013 and um, started working with OpenShift and Kubernetes around four years ago um, and joined WorldPay beginning of last year. Um, at WorldPay, I manage um, a small team um, and we run OpenShift container platforms on clouds and uh, we do that for um, internal microservice applications. Um, I'm here today um, to tell you about how and why we shifted to OpenShift Hive, um, which improved our efficiency and um, uh, started creating a global platform for us. And on that, um, can you hear me? No, wrong one. There we go. I'm Matt, I've been working on Kubernetes and OpenShift for around four years. I'm working with Burn Now at WorldPay. So before we start with OpenShift Hive, um, let me tell you a little bit about um, WorldPay. Um, maybe some of you heard already, um, uh, um, FIS and WorldPay merged uh, mid of last year, and we're now a part of FIS. Um, um, WorldPay um, itself is a part of merchant solution, um, and we sit alongside banking and capital market solutions from FIS. And OpenShift became an essential part in merchant solution for us to provide a PCI compliant platform um, to run our internal microservices. So let me talk about our journey to OpenShift 4, because I think that might be very interesting for everyone. So as a small team, for us, it was very important that we need to work very efficiently and so like reduce administrative overheads. We had the experience with um, OpenShift 3 that like, we didn't want it to, to manage our infrastructure and our cluster provisioning separately. Um, so for us, that was like very painful of, you know, like it was very time consuming and a lot of like manual steps. Um, OpenShift 4 was like great for us and like it addressed like some of the issues, but like we felt like the installer, like it's, it's, it didn't scale. It's for us, it was like we wanted to, we knew we wanted to have multiple clusters and like we had like, like I said, a small team of team members. So for us, that didn't scale. Um, so we were looking for something, um, something missing, uh, or there was something missing, and we were looking actually for like something that was more IP, API driven. So having a cluster management, and um, and we actually wanted to run cattle clusters and not pets anymore, like what we did with OpenShift um, version three. So. This all started basically a year ago um, when we became involved with the OpenShift 4 beta program. Um, and we increased our collaboration with Red Hat um, alongside with that. Um, um, so the beta engagement is how we found Hive, actually. Um, and it was very surprising for us, like hearing about Hive, like we never heard about it before. Um, so we, we asked uh, guys from Red Hat in London, actually, if they knew Hive, and actually not many of them knew at that time. Um, so, but we were pretty excited about like the capabilities and features um, OpenShift Hive has. So we started using that for um, our OpenShift 4 deployment. Um, basically, Hive is an API-driven cluster provisioning and uh, management operator, and this was exactly what we were looking for. Um, so we quickly um, extended the capabilities um, uh, uh, around Hive and like build a whole ecosystem around it to actually manage our um, OpenShift 4 clusters. Um, I will hand over to Matt now. Um, he will talk you through the cluster deployment with Hive. So we went about installing the Hive operator onto a single management cluster 
So this management cluster would have all the details of the other clusters which we're going to deploy using Hive. And we're able to actually define one of our clusters within a custom resource called a cluster deployment. So within that manifest, we'll be able to describe all the different details of the cluster, so the VPC subnets, the sizes, and everything which it looks like. Um, and when we apply that to the um, Kubernetes cluster, which runs the Hive operator, it will then go ahead and spin up our cluster and look after the reconciling of that cluster and the day-to-day -day operations around it. So we show a short demo. So this is on our Hive cluster. And we've got a manifest here, which is a cluster deployment. This is the alpha version of it. And within that, we've got some labels, one of them being uh, one of our own, which will define the environment. So we've called it an engineering environment. And we've also got some references to secrets, like our AWS account credentials. And we're going to be deploying it to AWS in the EU West one region. Um, and it's got loads of other secrets, like the Red Hat Pool secrets. It'll look very familiar to anybody who has installed a OpenShift 4 cluster. It's very similar to that um, install config. And then we're just describing what the compute looks like, the worker sizes, and nodes, what um, AZs are going to be in. So when I apply this manifest, the Hive operator will be watching for this custom resource. And it will set about um, some actions in order to install it. So it will download the actual binary installer. It will take our secrets, which are held in this management cluster. It will inject those into a pod, which will actually do the installation of this cluster. So we can see here, when I do get cluster deployments, we can see that it's not yet installed. It was only created 11 seconds ago. And I do get pods. And we can see that there is a image set pod and a provisioner pod. So the image set one's going to pull down all the resources which, which I need from Quay. And within the installer, you'll see very uh, familiar log entries from uh, the sort of Terraform bootstrapping process, which the installer does. So it's going to take around 45 minutes. And we can see that it's uh, working in AWS. It's creating our VPC, and it's starting that bootstrapping process. Um, Hive isn't just on AWS, so this could be on any of the cloud providers or on-prem. Um, anything which you can do with a normal installer, you can do with Hive. In this example, we're just showing AWS. And here we can see that the bootstrapping process has complete. We've got our new control plane, which has taken over the management of our cluster. And we've got some work nodes coming up. At this point, the installation of the cluster is done, and we've finished our day one activities of just creating the thing. We might be using this as a test cluster to test some new configuration or doing some development. It could be for any purpose for our team. But since it's all on the same management cluster, we all have access to this management cluster. We can get access to secrets like what the admin password for it and how it's set up. So it's a good collaboration or central collaboration area for us to go to. So I can grab the secret, log in, and hey, press it. There's my OpenShift 4 cluster. So great. Um, so we created an OpenShift 4 cluster with Hive. Um, but um, what comes next? Um, like we, how do we manage the configuration of these clusters, actually? Because this was the day two operations, like what we, what we um, uh, needed. Also. Um, how we do that with hundreds of um, configuration manifests and with multiple clusters and how we do promotions. And like the biggest problem actually what we face from um, OpenShift version three is like how do we avoid configuration drift? Um, um, Hive helped us um, um, by using sync sets and um, it basically regularly reconciles the configuration of all our clusters um, um, which are um, uh, and which are subscribed to and keep them basically synchronized. Um, Matt now will show you guys um, how we use sync sets with Hive. So another custom resource which is available to us um, on our Hive cluster is called the sync set. Um, so within this, we've basically got uh, one big manifest which contains all of our smaller manifests. So within that, we might have some configuration items like um, a daemon set or machine config, which will change our NTP time to sync with our on-prem area or something like that. 
And what we want to do is, in a similar way which we would subscribe a single machine to, say, stable in YUM, or unstable or testing um, repository, we want to use a similar sort of methodology to upgrade our different clusters. So we might do a little bit of development in an engineering cluster. We'll keep that in sync with our um, IAC repo in GitHub. And then when we're ready, we'll create a release. And then we'll actually create a single immutable sync set, which we can then promote through to higher environments. Making the actual sync sets um, it's quite difficult, though, because um, it's a, just a massive manifest. So what we went about doing was um, creating a generator, which should be able to look at a particular directory, uh, walk through it, take all the smaller manifests which are in there, and generate our one big manifest, which we can then apply to um, our Hive cluster. Um, if you're interested in that, we can show that later. So here's a um, demo of it actually running. Um, so within this particular directory, um, this emulates what our IAC repo would look like. Um, we've got two folders, patches and resources. So patches for any existing resources. For instance, we don't want any of our customers to be self-provisioning into our environment. Um, so we do a patch there and we've got some resources where we're going to say set up um, AD authentication into our OpenShift 4 environments, set up some secrets, those kinds of things. And we've got a little binary here which will run in this um, directory and that will create our one big manifest which has all the different resources and patches which are available um, to us there. Uh, one argument to it is um, the actual match labels. So we showed a label earlier where we defined what type of environment um, our cluster was going to be. So we want to target um, all clusters which are in that sort of environment. So that could be a pre-prod environment or a prod environment. We're saying any cluster which has those labels. So we've applied it now to our Hive cluster. So the Hive operator has recognized this. And we can see what the status of this uh, particular sync set is against our commons demo cluster. And then within there, you'd have all the different clusters which matched um, this sync set. So we can see here that we've got a lot of um, applied successfuls for each one of the manifests which are within the sync set. So it happily went to the, that cluster. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, so that basically led us off like using a type of a GitOps model to manage our clusters. Um, so the cluster configuration, um, so the cluster deployment and the configuration actually is stored in Git. And um, our engineers basically um, applying changes to the platform only um, via a single repository. Um, there are no manual changes um, to the platform anymore, um, which helps us avoiding drift, what I've mentioned before. Um, um, and like the, the big advantage actually is like we bundle our changes into releases. So you have seen that before. It's like we can pin um, environments to particular releases basically. Um, our CI tool is basically generating um, um, the manifest and applying them automatically to our management cluster. Um, and then um, basically Hive is running um, on, on that, as Matt um, explained that. So the rest is basically only doing Hive. Um, uh, it's um, pushing down the sync sets um, with the configuration down to the clusters, um, which are subscribed to. And uh, yeah, I think the only thing additionally to mention is like we also manage our um, promotions to higher environments um, through our CI tooling. So the benefits for us are role pay. Um, like I mentioned, the Hive operator like helped us to adopt the GitOps delivery model. Um, this had a big impact actually on on the team itself. It everyone started to be become more like a software engineer, and we shifted left, and actually started fo focusing on other things like writing uh, tests. So we really like um, focus on like test driven de test driven development um, for um, our platform. Um, but we also benefit actually from um, the closer relationship actually we have with Red Hat and the community. Um, uh, our internal developers benefited um, from the improved self-service capability of OpenShift 4, what was great, but also of Hive because now everything is in code. It's like, um, like adjusting quota changes of the namespace 
is now just a PR basically into our cluster repository. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have released channels and we're able to do um, controlled promotions of all our changes. And I think, do you have anything to add? No? And actually, that's it. Thank you, guys. Um, I hope this was interesting. Um, if you have any questions, grab us in the next coffee break yes. or uh, yeah. later today. So. Yeah, and we'll do as I can.